Okay, looks like people are starting to file in here. Looks like once again, Doug, looks like we've got people uh, represented from coast to coast. Cool. I'll just wait a couple more seconds to make sure you know, people will be joining us over the next uh, minute or two. I don't know if you know this, Doug, but I had someone reach out to me from Australia uh, asking for the recordings because there was a 12 hour time difference. So they weren't able to attend live, but uh, they are quite interested. So uh, actually this webinar series has technically gone international. <laughs> there you go, there you go. It's not like it's a World Cup, eh? They're not getting up for it. I can make it. <laughs> All right, so I'll stop sharing this poll here. Looks like the majority of people are from Ontario. But we do have uh, people from coast to coast, from British Columbia to the Atlantic provinces, and also down into the states. I'm just going to uh, put one more poll here just to get a sense of what occupation uh, everyone is in. So there's quite a number of occupation options listed there. If your occupation is not listed, just in the chat, let us know um, what industry you work in and what you do. So excellent, Doug, once again, we look like, it looks like the, uh, the majority of our attendees are builders and renovators, uh, but we have a sprinkling through trades, engineering, energy advisors, government officials um, at all levels and uh, suppliers and utilities. Excellent, excellent, very excellent. cool. Excellent, okay, so uh, I'll just show everybody the results of that so you can see that. All right. Okay, so welcome everyone. My name is Stephanie Coleman and we are at now the fourth of the four part series from Bleeding Edge to Leading Edge, a Builder's Guide to Net Zero. And today uh, is the much anticipated Is Your Baby Ugly uh, session. I can't wait to, uh, to learn a lot today. So before we get started, what I wanted to do was just do a bit of Zoom housekeeping like I do each time. The, the functions that you see at the bottom of your screen, uh, you'll see that there's a Q&A function as well as a chat function. So please, for any questions that you have of our presenters today, please uh, use the Q&A function that uh, manages questions most effectively. If you have general comments that you wanna make or if you have any um, uh, technical issues, things like that, just put that in the chat. And we do have just a few poll questions for you throughout, uh, so please be sure to participate in that. So that's all I have for our, um, our uh, uh, Zoom housekeeping, so I'd like to hand it over to Susan, to, uh, who is our Enbridge sponsor, uh, to speak. Oh, thanks, staff. Um, I guess what I really want to say is uh, just on behalf of Enbridge Gas, uh, we want to welcome everybody participating in our fourth and final session today. Um, also wanted to take the opportunity to say a very special thanks to Doug for his willingness to share his journey through the land of net zero buildings and to help others learn from both his successes and, and his mistakes. To date on this, uh, these four sessions, we've had historically 627 participating in the first three sessions and today will take us well over 700 times that someone has learned something from, from Doug's very much appreciated teaching. So thank you for that. Um, you know how to draw a crowd, Doug, so, so congrats. Also wanna mention not to forget to register for the Enbridge January webinar on January 5th, uh, 14th, we're gonna be featuring uh, Tim Bailey of Avid Ratings. He's gonna be presenting on what your home buyers are looking for in the market. And uh, so take advantage of that research so it can inform your marketing of your product and your brand pos positioning to gain some market share. So with that, I wanna thank everybody for participating in all of the webinars for 2020 to date. We look forward to having you with us in 2021. We wanna wish everyone a very safe, healthy and peaceful holiday season. We wanna say stay well and stay vigilant. It's not over yet, but we're getting there together. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Steph, 
Thanks again. Thank you, Susan, for your kind words. And absolutely, um, if it wasn't for Enbridge, you know, these opportunities couldn't be uh, made possible. So thank you to Enbridge and to Susan for your uh, sponsorship and your support in being able to educate the building industry. And of course, a big thank you to Doug uh, for uh, developing this four part series that I know is a lot of work to uh, create in a one month time frame. But Doug, you've done a great job and I'm looking forward to today with, uh, with, with Hal. So with that, I will hand it over to Doug. He is the Vice President for Doug Terry Holmes. Back it up. 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 He's the vice president for Doug Terry Holmes. I, I know all this stuff, you know, it's just I need to read it. Um, he's a past president for the Ontario Home Builders Association. He continues to be the OHBA technical chair and he sits on the uh, as membership uh, for the CHB Net Zero Council as well as the Technical Research Council at the national level. And uh, he is a man with many awards presented to him, uh, two of which this year were the CHBA Member of the Year and the Interna uh, Interquality Hall of Fame inductee. So Doug, I'm handing it over to you. Okay, thanks Steph. Uh, just like every other time, it's kind of like mm -hmm. NASCAR. We put our foot on the gas and go really fast, turn left, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've got to take the first opportunity though to thank our sponsors. Uh, you just heard from Susan, you know, what a forward thinking company. We're very honored to be working with them as we know where we're being transitioning as an industry and, and the work that they're putting into that transition is really amazing. So uh, stay tuned for some of the really great things that they're doing, like we talked about last week. Uh, Steph, it's been a pleasure having you along as my co-pilot and guiding me on this. Uh, I, I couldn't think of anybody else I'd rather do it with. And, uh, you know, the team at Building Knowledge and everything they've done to, to help us through the years. Uh, and then, the, you know, the seed funding from Intercan, this type of project doesn't happen without having some, some support and, uh, and helping us to get it up and off the ground. So we're really thankful for the, the work that uh, Patrick and the team at Intercan have done. Okay, why am I doing this? As always, a couple of new photos of the grandbaby. He got a little hungry there the one day, decided he wanted to see what grandpa's uh, nose tasted like. But uh, I don't think he's a cannibal, but he's, uh, he is a splitting image, isn't he? That's why we're doing it. That's why we're doing it because we have one planet and we got to figure out how to make sure it's good for these kids to have their grandkids, right? So what are we going to try and accomplish today on our last session stuff? And I can't believe it's the last one. Well, uh, we're going to look at a little tiny bit on how much does it cost. We're going to talk a little bit about optimal value engineering, a bit of a deep dive on uh, advanced framing, which we'll go through fairly quickly. Uh, we're going to touch base on how to sell net zero just to get people thinking about positioning. And then I cannot wait for the last bit, which is going to be really a lot of fun, which is how, how uh, is your baby ugly with how, how Peller, a good friend of mine. So really excited to introduce Hal a little bit later on, but let's get after it. So it costs how much? Hey, wait a minute. This thing, it still costs more money, right? Our spec says it's between 15 to 20, maybe $25,000 more than a, a code built home, right? Uh, however, there's rising code requirements that are climbing that this number is being eroded and, and the number's getting closer and closer, right? But I'll bet you a lot of people are saying, well, that's, that's probably a little bit less than I thought it was, right? I thought it was gonna be in the 30 to 40,000 range. So almost half of, of what, uh, what people are anticipating we're finding typically. Uh, for that net zero ready piece. And, and there's some reasons why we were able to get our numbers down. And we're continuing to drop that number, by the way. Uh, part of it is optimal value engineering, right? So when we look at the windows that I've talked about repeatedly, that's an example of, of optimal value engineering. What, what is OVE or optimal value engineering? Well, what, what that is, you see, is that's doing more with less that's looking rationally at alternatives and choosing the least expensive option that is still acceptable. And it's also by designing careful selection, making something for 90 cents that the average person would take a dollar to make. So how can we do it a little bit more effectively, right? And that's really setting up today, right? So here's some examples. Historically, when we look at studs, they were dimensionally slightly larger than they are now, and they became standardized at three and a half by an inch and a half. When we look at water pipes, well, we started with galvanized iron and then we went to copper and now we're on the plastic pipe. And a lot of that was just the speed of install. We looked at windows as being 
Well, I, I can actually, I met the guy that actually stuff used to build the windows into the houses that my dad was building. I met the glazer one time several years ago, but we had single glazed windows and then they had storms on them. And then we went to double pane and then we went to triples. And now we're looking at high performance windows. And we've talked quite a bit about those uh, site built kitchens. I'm doing a reno on a house right now. And yeah, we pulled the site built kitchen that my dad's carpenter made 41 years ago. And we're replacing it with cabinets built by a cabinet manufacturer. I'm really glad in this rental that I don't have to deal with lath and plaster, although our guest Hal has got quite a bit of experience on that. Uh, we use gypsum board nowadays. Site built roof rafters versus trusses. Well, the house is site built roof rafters and we're having to do an extension of the roof. And so it's all being stick framed, right? Uh, and you're lucky if you get a frame that really understands stick framing nowadays, especially the roofs. Uh, Oil-based paints then went to latex and now as we've talked a couple times in these sessions looking at you know more modern paints that are uh, a little bit healthier for the environment that are that are mineral based. And then last is uh, you know we used to have paint in place wood siding and now it's been replaced originally by aluminum then some of these new composites uh, the, the pre-finished hardboard like the hardy uh, steel aluminum that sort of thing. So these are all examples of optimal value engineering that have worked their way into becoming standards really for how we build. Here's a couple of uh, examples of what we can do to improve our optimal value engineering of the homes we're building though. So here's a window on one of our homes uh, and, and down below here you see the six foot patio door and then there's the six foot window with the slider below and up above stuff I got two four by four windows. So you know what happens there? All of your load from above gets landed right down on top of this window and this here door. Now you can you can figure out the header pretty easily, but it has to be engineered. So there's a cost to engineer both of those uh, openings on the main floor because of the load coming down from the floor above. If those windows are made bigger, the difference in cost for the size of the window versus the framing of the wall is probably close to a wash. So if the room will support it, it doesn't always happen, but if the room will support it, here's a way, especially this one I believe is the master bedroom, you can have a bigger window in your master and cut some cost out of the house by doing this. So match the window with the width wherever possible. I mean, we used to do that before and we're gonna get into that a little bit. Here's another one. When we look at this room right here, it says it's 15 one by 12 six. Well, 12 six is a bit of a challenge dimensionally because our carpet comes at 12 feet and our studs, or sorry, our floor joists. Now we're looking at, okay, do we have to go to 14 foot to make this work? Depends on your, 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 your floor layout, but it could possibly be that you've got an issue with that, you've got an issue with your subfloor, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of things that are impacted by the fact that this is six inches oversized. So is that worth it or is it waste, right? We've talked previously about the windows, but just looking at the same windows we looked at in the last session, where I've got the window on the left, that has got a high heat gain, the window on the right, it's got a low heat gain. So the window on the right costing slightly more money, what does that mean? It means I can reduce my AC load and size. It means I can reduce my duct size. And oftentimes it will help me avoid having to oversize my furnace because if the AC is too big, then it will actually require a larger furnace, furnace to, to fit it, right? But what happens then? You've got all three of these components costing more money. So what we did is a very deep dive. You heard quite a bit of it last week, a very deep dive on how to get that down. And then what we did is we upgraded our mechanicals with our savings. So we went with an ECM motor and continual modulation, right? So can we reinvest the money elsewhere is also part of it to improve performance. So our additional cost is not just meeting net zero, it's improving performance beyond net zero requirements. Uh, advanced framing is a part of OBE. And so we're just gonna look at some slides on advanced framing this morning, because folks, if you don't have it on your radar, this is an area where you can use less wood and have a stronger house. I know that sounds weird, right? Less wood, but a stronger house. Well, when you do that, it means you're gonna have space for more insulation, okay? So instead of a two by six wall, it used to be a two by four wall in my presentations, but you know, we've, we've, we've grown here now. We're using two by six walls for the most part, right? And then you've got 16 inch on center, right? Well, you don't need to. The code doesn't say thou shalt put in a 16 inch on center exterior wall. Right, uh, double top plates is another thing. And looking at three stud corners, jack studs, cripples, and looking at our headers and the size, the depth of our headers, right? Most builders are just putting in two two by tens and calling it a day. Well, a 24 inch opening may not need two two by tens. I'm just saying, right? 
So what we look at with advanced framing walls is can we go 24 inch on center? Can we have a single top plate? Uh, looking at two stud corners or maybe a modified three stud, no jack studs, no cripples, no singles and headers, that sort of thing. So most of us that aren't framers are going, what's he talking about? Well, let me show you. When we look at an eight foot section of wall and we're looking at a 16 inch on center, that eight foot section requires seven studs. If I drop down to five studs at the bottom, it's five studs for the same distance. So you're knocking two studs out. Now you do that around the entire house and you're starting to have some savings. It's about three foot total that you can remove from a typical home that is now more insulation, right? So that's pretty cool, right? Now on the interior, we don't go to 24 inch on center, uh, partly because it's mostly two by four walls, but partially to, partly to stiffen the drywall, we go to 19 two on center, which still drops several studs throughout the home. Uh, advanced framing is really popular to have a two stud corner and then for bracing on the corners, you're gonna put OSB with foam uh, or there's an alternative three stud corner which has continuous insulation. It shows here at one inch, but we're, we're using one and a half now. This is actually in situ what it looks like stuff. And the reason why we did this is because we found if we actually went and tried to do the detail on the left, it's a lot more work and the framers were gonna charge us quite a bit more money because now you've got three different materials here on site, not two, but three, because you've got your foam that's continuous and then that stops for about two stud cavities back in each direction where it's half inch OSB and then the foam's attached on top of that. So it's quite a bit more framing than simply doing this, right? So the modified three stud corner is benefited because it's got the foam on the outside. So it's blocking the thermal bridging from coming through, but you can still get insulation in from each side. So it's a much better performing corner than a typical stud wall, right? Uh, we also look at some other things, like as I said, the rigid insulation being continuous and then looking at an angled T-brace to help structurally support it. We found that this had really a limited impact on energy rating versus the different option, especially now that we're at an inch and a half of foam on the outside or whatever your, your performance element is, we're talking about an R7 and a half on the outside. Uh, intersecting walls, I've got shown here what a T-framing detail would look like, again, allowing intersect, uh, intersecting walls to have insulation behind. We typically actually do ladder framing instead, but this is the one I had for today. And Steph, just to note in this picture, this is how far back we've been going on advanced framing. This picture was taken in 2011. So, you know, we're, we're really, I think we're coming into our 11th year now of doing advanced framing. I mentioned before windows. Well, if you've got a window like this and you stack the windows and you probably don't even need a header above. And if this window had been smaller, uh, it would have fit between the trusses up above. There would have been no header here. We wouldn't have needed it. But what it isn't, it is not two two by tens that are slapped together and put in place because we had two by tens sitting there. It is designed for the load above. And that allows us a lot more insulation into the walls by doing this. And it's surprising the number of uh, headers that you can really reduce if you know what you're doing and what to look for. Again, depending on where, where bearing loads are, you may have to do a, a larger header and sometimes you've got to get it engineered, but that's more of a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. And then down below, here's a spot where guys like to go crazy with wood. You're going to end up a lot of times you'll see a cripple here and another cripple here and there's maybe a double cripple here. None of that's needed. All your loads coming from above down beside the window on your bearing. Right, so you can avoid a lot of additional cuts, which is less time in situ and less material being used. So it's not really, you don't wanna hide wood in the house just cause you got it sitting there and you don't wanna recycle it. It's, it's better to not use it if you don't need it. Uh, stack framing, this is where the strength comes from. So from the roof down through your load path to the foundation, stack framing. This home was actually an oversized home. That's why it has the hurricane clips. We are doing that now as a standard though, but we're using the screws. Again, pictures from 2011, uh, but the stack framing makes this house a lot stronger. We could actually eliminate this double top plate here. The reason why we don't go after that is because we have to get the building officials more approved uh, to understand it and, and agree with that. But we also have an issue with some of our dimensional products that are designed for the double top plate. So that's on our to-do list down the road, but we felt we'd gone far enough along at this point in time. It was fairly simple, the, the easy wins, the low-hanging fruit, and we've left it at that for now, you know, going on almost 11 years. But it's, uh, it, it, there's still some possibilities there, and there's some really great savings as far as materials and, and that in there. Um, 
how do we make that happen? Well, you know, there's these companies that they go around and they train people, which is really cool. And they've got these people, uh, energy advisors, I think they call them, and they can help us with this. And so I, I like to do that on a regular basis, but we also do site walks and we have crews that go and they train our people on how to do this work and they train them a lot. And we go back and we check. And if we bring on a new crew, that new crew gets teamed with another crew until they're up to speed, right? So ongoing training sessions are, are highly practical and very much so needed. And I know folks are gonna say, we're too busy. We don't have time to address the training, that sort of thing. The savings on site will way more than make up for the fact that you've had to take them offline for a couple hours or what have you. Uh, we try and do it on a fairly reasonably regular basis. A lot of it's now just done by our site supers that have been trained on the details, but it's constant and ongoing and our details reflect exactly what we're trying to get out of it. Uh, one careful caveat to this is be careful with your framers because they love wood and breaking old habits is hard and they're going to want to put the wood in that they don't need to. So you really have to work with them on it. Uh, especially on cripples and headers. You know, it's just very easy to slap two two by tens in there and not read the plan. And we don't want that. So our advanced framing is basically everything that we talked about above with a couple of exceptions. One is, is we are still doing a double top plate. And the second one is, is we're doing a three stud corner, but it's got an inch and a half of foam on it. So Steph, that's kind of a quick run through of a couple of areas in optimal value engineering and, and advanced framing that we've used, and I'm just giving examples of how we've cut costs. It doesn't mean that there aren't other opportunities, but I wanted to give some solid opportunities or demonstration of how we've looked to cut costs and some of the things we've done. There's lots of other things out there we can do, right? We did have a couple of questions that came in. Uh, so before sure. we move on to how to sell it. Uh, so one was, um, is half inch OSB plus half inch of foam suggested? Um, and are there, it's, it's kind of a multi-pointed question, um, and are there rigid insulations that don't require OSB? And then which rigid insulation is preferred? Uh, I'll tell you which in, rigid insulation is not preferred, and I mentioned it previously, is the polyisocyanurate with the foil uh, insulation. Uh, that, that product should not be being sold in Canada. Uh, there's enough evidence now to suggest that it loses thermal uh, benefits as it gets cold with the weather out now. And so it really, it's designed for Southern climates or, or warm weather climates for, for keeping the, the air conditioning in. Uh, I would not recommend that product. But as far as the other products go, uh, Rockwool and, and Owens Corning both have a really good mineral wool product that could be done. You'd wanna have a house wrap on the outside of it. In fact, I've got a renovation project coming up uh, for several homes. And that's exactly what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna approach it from the outside uh, and, and work outside in. And we're going to take the siding off and we'll be putting that product on specifically and then post wrapping it because I don't want to go inside out and rip the drywall out if I don't need to. Um, so there's there's lots of different insulations. The, the detail that I showed is it's a bit tricky. And the reason for the half inch OSB or plywood is because it's for, for lateral bracing, especially in the corners. We got around that by doing a, a beefed up uh, so a modified three stud corner that allowed for more insulation, but was quite structurally strong with a T-brace. Uh, the detail can be done with, uh, it's actually an inch of foam, I think nowadays with a half inch OSB, uh, but it's more work, right? And so typically the framers are gonna charge you more. And I don't think that there's enough of an energy performance for a production builder at the very least to, to look at that being enough of a benefit. So hopefully that covered it. Thank you. Uh, and the other one was more just a comment, so I'll just read it. It says uh, that, that this person has used one by two uh, wall metal angles to allow proper installation for insulation in the corners. Uh, the drywall installer installs it when they do the drywall. Drywall clips, great idea. Mm -hmm. Great There's idea. One, yeah. Yeah. Another good spot for that is on interior wall ceilings. Let your, let your drywall float so you can cut down on the... Uh, truss uplift that causes the, all the problems with the drywall. Are you talking about like a resilient channel? No, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long drywall clip. Instead of using, oh, okay. a lot of times builders will put, the, or framers will put the, uh, the, the plate running on top of the plate and then you, you attach to that. Uh, I really recommend floating it, right? So if you can actually attach it to the wall and not the ceiling, there's a couple of ways to do that. Let the, let the, the wall drywall hold the ceiling drywall or use the clip like they're talking about. And that, and that works great in that application as well. 
Okay. There's one other question that just came in, and then uh, if you want to move on after that. Uh, so it's, uh, will you be relying on the exterior wrap as your air barrier, or will you be using six mil poly on the inside? Well, that's a really good commentary right there, question-wise. Uh, where I ultimately see us going and a lot of the industry going is not necessarily an exterior air barrier, but a, a modified version of an air barrier, and specifically using a product like Aero Barrier. We're doing a lot of experimenting right now. In fact, we just met with them virtually yesterday uh, for a follow-up. Where we're using aero barrier, we're taking the poly off the interior walls. There is a solution though, if you're not wanting to do that, and that would be going to a breathable membrane. So it's a, a switchable membrane. I, I use the smart uh, smart membrane by, uh, by certainty, but there's other products out on the, on the market now. I think uh, oh, the company's gonna escape me, but there's, there are other products available on the market now that can be used. Uh, Dorkin has one as well. And so they actually, they, they act as a, as a vapor barrier at certain times of the year and as, as open, uh, open cell at certain times of the year to allow vapor to migrate out. So when, when the vapor is gonna get stuck in the wall, it will allow it to migrate out. And then in the winter time, when it's trying to escape, it'll block it from getting in there. So there, there are some different options there. Am I good? Thank you. Yep, we're good, thank you. Okay, cool. I want to leave lots of time for house, so I'm going to keep right on going. How to sell it. Okay, there's, here's the thing. is what I found. First thing to say, but it's more money. Yes, your sales staff are probably going to tell you that. It's more money. Okay, can we move on now? Yes, it's more money. But there's better value there, right? So how do we teach people about the better value? Well, the analogy I like to give is, oh, okay, but, but we do sell... Cadillacs in the market, right? Not everybody drives a Chevy, right? The Cadillac is still sold. Mercedes sold, you know, too. BMW sell. Uh, you, you never buy a car by the pound, right? It's always by the brand and the features. And so the analogy I like is, are we showing the value that people understand why they're buying something that's better, right? As opposed to, gosh, that's 50 cents more than my competitor. I don't think I can do it. Well, no, you've, you haven't looked at the value then, right? So uh, how do we do it? Well, the first thing is train, train, train. And then once you're done that, you know what you do stuff? You bring in your energy advisor and you train, train, train again. And then a little bit while later, guess what you do? You train some more, right? And they're still probably not gonna be comfortable, but we're gonna talk about that towards the end about how to get them a little bit more comfortable. But you train, right? Uh, you have to create an understanding of the offering. That's really critically important. You have to make sure that they understand why it's different and why that's better and, uh, and why it's better value, right? So particularly, they've got to be able to do their elevator sales pitch, the, the 60 seconds piece on why it's better, right? And uh, we need to create some simple steps for easy presentations, something that, you know, anybody can, I got it, I visually can understand this, or tactile is incredibly important feel. I can feel this. And, uh, and then the next thing is messaging on, on logic for the justification. Remember, it's an emotional buy, but we want to message on logic. So let's get into that just a little bit. First of all, it's not an option. If you try and sell net zero as an option, you're going to struggle. Now, some guys are going to be really good at it, and some, some guys are going to be really tough at it, and some of their sales staff are going to be really upset with them because it, it sends a bit of a mis, 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 mixed mixed message, you see. And the biggest reason is, and we found this every time we've tried to do this type of transition as an option is, well, if it's so good, then why isn't it included as standard? Because I would have just thought it should be standard if it's that good. Oops, now what do we do? So in typical terms, what, what we found is it's a lot tougher to build in as, as an option because people are gonna go pretty because they're buying an emotional buy. They're gonna go for that granite countertop, right? What we need to be able to do is explain to them why this is better, why they're going to want it, how it helps them to pay for the granite countertop over time, right? But that's that's really kind of where I've landed is that I don't like trying to do this stuff as an option. We started Energy Star as an option. We started Net Zero Ready as an option. What we did for the Net Zero Ready for us to, to build our legs is we used it in our spec homes. So the quick possession homes all came with it, and it didn't stop us from selling one of them. And at that point, it was like, okay, are we good? We should be able to move forward with this now. And there was still some resistance from the sales team and I don't blame them. They're like, but I, I, I don't wanna be hurt by this, right? I don't want my customers to be hurt, but I don't wanna be hurt by this. Remember a lot of them are on commission 
and they don't want their source of income to dry up because we're doing something crazy, right? So we have to figure out how to give them comfort. And part of that is site demonstrations and a lot of it comes back to the training piece, right? Uh, so here's an example. I'm gonna get into the windows again for half a sec. You can tell there's been a theme, four parts on windows, right? Because it's so critically important. So the first thing is, is have the prospect, remember we're talking about a triple pane window here now, right? With low solar glass, have the prospect touch the glass. Oh, hey, wow, it's minus 20 out and that glass is still pretty warm. That's great, kind of crazy. Your glass at home, is it like that? Or do you find your glass at home is colder? Oh, we have such a draft around the windows. Okay, now you've got them understanding. Okay, in summertime, even better when you got the sun beating down on it. You know, the little ant with the magnifying glass, we don't really want to do that to ants. It's not fair to them. But that's what our customers, that's what we're doing to our customers by using regular glass when we should be using low solar glass. So if you can have them go and touch that hot, supposedly glass because the sun's beating on it and they're like, wow, that's like regular temperature. I know, right? Now you've got them bonded with a tactile feel to that window. I understand that that's better, right? So the next thing is, is the importance of windows as well is about improving overall temperature in the room. And we talked the other day about the fact that it can reduce on, on drafts. Well, we want to make sure that the client understands. By the way, when I just demonstrated that window, that also means because it's not a lot colder than the rest of the room, you're not going to have that draft when you're feeling uncomfortable when you're sitting in the room in the wintertime. Or you're not going to cook like the ant with the magnifying glass when you're sitting here in the summertime. And, you know, again, the worst thing is, is in the summer, you have to bring blinds down in the wintertime, you're putting curtains on. Why? Because you have a poor window and now you're losing your view. Well, a lot of times we're want that view and we're losing it because we've got a bad window. So what's more expensive, a little bit more cost in the window or having to do blinds and curtains and, sc and screens and overhangs and all that stuff. I just say, get it right the first time, right? This Doug, is a really, yeah. Um, another benefit of, uh, of the low solar glass like you talked about too for homeowners is, uh, you know how frustrating it is when your curtains get faded or your furniture, or ah. your flooring. Right, yeah. so that's another huge event advantage. Your hair, uh, you know, when your hair gets faded, <laughs> ah, it sucks. I, I don't like that. Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, it's a really great point, stuff. And and when we look at and, and by the way, the Cardinal website I think was on the bottom of there. Uh, it, it's it will make sure it's included in the link, but they do talk extensively at about that on the on the Cardinal Glass website about the three six six glass and why it's so important. So let's make sure that that goes out in our, in our links, okay? Uh, here's another one, a coffee cup versus a thermos. Now everybody's had a hot cup, you know, and you burnt your hand with it, right? They even, you know, at the Timmy's, they double it up and then you forget and you pull the second cup out and there's a, a first cup there, right? Especially with a hot black coffee, that's really, really common because it's so hot. Well, that's the physics of heat going from hot to cold and it's burning your hand because the coffee's heat is getting into your hand. Well, guess what? Remember last week when I said, yes, hot air rises, but heat goes from hot to cold. When you're standing on that basement floor and it does have insulation underneath of it, you're losing a lot of heat out your feet and that makes you cold, okay? That's that same physics as the coffee cup versus the thermos. So a really nice trick that I like to do is, this is a lot of fun here now, as I say to the client prospect, hey, listen, I want you to go down to the, the neighboring builder's house and go and just do a walk around this basement, you know, make sure you're in your stocking feet, but go, go have a look at their basement. Cause when you come back, I want to talk to you a little bit about our basement and why it's different. And then about, you know, 15, 20 minutes later, they'll come back and I'll take them down the basement and I'll show them sort of the different features and that sort of thing. And Hey, you know, we're about seven minutes in here now. And I'll say, uh, you notice anything about your feet? Well, yeah, they, they're, they're not cold. You, you found that the other builder's basement, it was pretty cold, right? Yeah, this basement, what do you do different in here? Is this, is this like heating in the floor? No, we just insulated it. That's all we did. Wow. Do you mean I can be, I'm going to be warm down here? Yeah, and your kids, your kids can play down here too, and they're going to be comfortable. And they're done. They're done. They understand now that this house is different and they want it. And it's really that simple. Let them go see the competitor, bring them back, let them try your house, right? How am I doing on time here? I want to keep going on the time. Uh, we talked about smart ducting a couple of times. So here's a, a little detail. This was from the Abacus Lab in Pittsburgh. I've mentioned that I went down and worked with them down there. On the left-hand side is a register that's coming out of the floor and how it's just petering out through the room. And you can see there's lots of spaces where it's not even really hitting all of the additional walls. On the right-hand side is an interior wall high throw smart duct, which is medium velocity. A lot of times it's running on lower velocity and it'll throw a solid 14 feet, right? 
And so, and, and actually it can get to 16, but it's solid at 14 feet. It's air mix, both heating and cooling is significantly better. So why do we care about this right now when I'm talking about sales? You know what, one of the biggest complaints that, that homeowners have about their home stuff? I couldn't put my couch where I wanted it because there's a stupid vent right in the way, right? How often does that happen? Uh, I was walking outside and I stood on the vent because it's right in the doorway. What a terrible place to put it. We don't have to do that anymore, folks. Not with better insulated walls and proper insulation and air sealing and we've got better at performing windows. No, we don't have to do that. What we can actually do is stuff like interior wall high throw. And then your, your returns, well, they go up high upstairs and down low downstairs, but they're a little bit more centralized and tucked out of the way. And they're not at the window. They don't, none of this has to be at the window anymore. It needs to aim at the window. It needs to go across the window. And sometimes in the basement, it might drop down from above. You never want to drop it on people's feet or their heads, but anything else is fair game. And if we can talk them into that, they're going to say, well, you know, it's better performing is the reason their justification. But really what it's about is they're more comfortable, but more importantly, they can put their furniture wherever they want. And that is a huge selling feature. When we first started doing this, we had a lot of folks who were like, yeah, I don't know about those little holes in the wall. And as soon as we walked them through, you can put the furniture wherever you want. It was game over, you know, done, right? Uh, I've covered that. So you can see the little uh, discs on the wall. I think we've seen this slide before. And then this is our supplies. They're tiny, right? No more huge trunks taking up a big amount of space. So we're on a poll question here. You ready for the poll question? Here. Uh, I think, uh, did I, oops. That might I be me. We'll I go with that. yours then. <laughs> Sorry. We'll go with yours. <laughs> okay, no problem. Yeah, we'll have to just go. Uh, wing it here sorry about that so are you implementing lean building practices into your construction projects is the first poll question it's same same it's close enough yeah <laughs> all right so it looks like we've got uh, about half of the people have responded with mixed results i'll just share what we've got here here you go so it looks like the majority are um, some are not, and well, in, in some cases, it's just not applicable to whatever it yeah. is that they're working on. That's a pretty good number, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, what else have I got here? I think I'm on to how to lean it out. So we are at 138, so we've got a fair bit of time left. I think I did mm -hmm. pretty good here, and yeah. uh, this is a really awesome. Uh, I'm so pumped to be in conversation coming up here with my friend Hal Peller. So Hal is from True North Developments. He's a trainer there. Uh, he's a certified virtual speaker. He's a Lean Six Sigma certified. Uh, he's also applied improvisational certified practitioner. That's a mouthful right there. I'll let him explain that. And he comes to us from Brooklyn, New York. Are you in Brooklyn today, Hal, or are you, uh, you still in Washington area? Uh, actually in Washington, D.C., but my home's in Brooklyn. His home's in Brooklyn. So... Ladies and gentlemen, I am putting you in fantastic hands right now for the next 15 to uh, have Hal join us. And thank you so much for agreeing to, to take part in this today. Really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Doug and, and Steph. Appreciate it. Uh, yes, my name is Hal Peller. And who is Hal Peller? Well, um, uh, I ran a, uh, oh, I'm from Brooklyn, as Doug said. Where's my, uh, oh, I need to share my screen, don't I? Yeah, I dropped out for you. Okay. Share screen, share. How's that? That looks good. All right, great. So, who is Hal Peller, a legend in his own mind? As Doug said, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and uh, uh, so you got Brooklyn in the house today, yo, yo, yo. Uh, but um, I got family in uh, Toronto, Ontario, so not all bad. Uh, I had a construction company in New York City for over 20 years, specialized in historic and landmark properties, uh, including the Smithsonian's Cooper Hewitt, Ellis Island, uh, the Dakota. And I, I worked in a lot of pre-war buildings, building new homes in the, uh, the pre-war buildings, using uh, making it look old 
but bringing in modern conveniences. Um, nominated into the uh, New York Landmarks Conservancy and uh, published, my, my work was published in Victoria Magazine, Old House Journal and Architectural Digest. Uh, I closed up my company in, in 2004 to go to work with Scott Saddam and True North Development. True North is the largest uh, consultancy firm for the building industry in North America. I did training with them back in the day uh, on quality, on leadership, sales, uh, and uh, customer satisfaction. And then the downturn hit in 2007. So I got Lean Six Sigma certified at Villanova University. And since then, uh, True North, uh, uh, we've done over 50, I've done over 50 Lean events with True North since that time. Uh, my passion is improvisation for the theater. And I've uh, became a, a, a facilitated over 40 years. In 1988, I started doing improv workshops um, all over the world actually now. Uh, and became and I learned to uh, combine the uh, um, the principles of improvisation for corporate training, and I use that in uh, for my corporate training. I've been teaching improvisation since 1980, uh, and I volunteer in the public schools since I love the process so much. Uh, working with fifth, sixth, and seventh graders, teaching them basic improv skills, um, and I see that the uh, outcome is the grades go up, the self-esteem is, is out there. It's such a powerful, powerful process. I even coach stand-ups. So Doug asked me to come down and talk about uh, uh, the ugly baby concept. True North has done many lean events in, uh, nor in North America, in the world, actually. We even did a few lean events in, in uh, Australia. Um, called the Lean Blitz. And Doug asked me to speak about the ugly baby concept. And I thought, wow, what kind of parent would ask, uh, would enter their baby into an ugly baby contest? Uh, your baby's so ugly that you take her to work with you so you, every day so you don't have to kiss her goodbye. <laughs> your baby is so ugly that when you try to enter him into an ugly baby contest, the judges say, sorry, no professionals. <laughs> I'll be here till Tuesday, thank you very much. Well, what kind of parent would enter that a baby into an ugly baby contest? World, uh, 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 parents don't want to hear that their baby is ugly. That's personal, hurtful, and just not true. Even if it is true, all parents think that their babies are adorable, remarkable, beautiful, and not ugly. But wait, there are prizes? Now with cash prizes, we have incentive to, to allow the judges to say that our babies are ugly. And we've, I've learned that in giving, them, giving people permission to say that our baby is ugly, there are lean, with lean, there are huge, huge savings, big dollars and a million dollars. So the, the winner is, drum roll please, This was a, a gift given to me in an eight by 10 uh, frame, beautifully framed after a week long lean blitz at, right at, at here in Ontario. And uh, um, they heard me say to each of the trades to make them feel comfortable, telling them where we're hurting them and our systems and processes are killing them, that it's okay to call our baby ugly. And we won't be offended, I promise you. The fact of the matter is, you can't fix ugly, but you can fix a broken process or a missing process. So what, uh, what is lean anyway? <clears throat> lean is uh, the removal of waste from the flow of work. Well, what is waste? That's something in the process that does not add value. Well, who defines value? customer defines value. And if the customer is not knowingly or willingly uh, uh, pay for it, it's waste. That's, that's who defines value. So sometimes you have to train the customer 
to understand what's valuable, but basically it's their, they're the final word. And who identifies the waste? Well, the people that build your, or you're in your homes day in and day out, your suppliers and trades are your experts. These are folks, uh, you trade contractor, uh, wait, 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 where am I? Oh, the folks who build your homes, they, so the framers, the HVAC team, the electrical contractors, the masons, the drywallers, the painters, the uh, uh, floor installers, the hardware folks, the window suppliers, the plumbing fixture suppliers, the lighting fixture suppliers, the roofers, the brickers, even your cleaning teams. We, we're asking our, 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 our folks to build a jewel box in the middle of a muddy field with 40,000 parts and pieces in, in, with all the weather and everything to deliver a beautifully finished award-winning home to our customers. Do you think those folks know where the waste is, where the pain is? Here's, a, here's the number one waste in North America. So you, you, your contractor will text your site super, is the job ready for us? Site super text back, yeah, it's ready, hurry up, come in, we gotta get the job done. So based on that, you load up the truck, the van with materials and, and equipment and, and, and personnel, and you drive the 30 or 40 kilometers to get to the site. And uh, guess what? The plumber would, didn't show up or the weather delayed didn't happen. And guess what? Your job is not ready. But meanwhile, you've got all that material and all that equipment. The, so the dry, the dry run or the wasted trip is the number one waste in North, all of North America. Every builder has this an ugly as an ugly. So what does that cost? And and do the trades charge that back to the home builder? You know most trades don't. That's just they just eat it and just uh, that's a cost of doing business. But is that painful? Especially if they have to go back to the warehouse and unload the material. And is there a restocking fee? True North generated a uh, trip cost calculator for our lean blitz uh, to take into account uh, how many people load up the truck, how, mu how much time does it take, how, how far do you have to drive on average to get to a job site, and all it takes into calculation all the, the insurance, the upkeep for the equipment and the van, the uh, taxes and everything that every nickel that you spend to go to a job site that isn't ready. It's huge. And a lot of the people that, that work the, the uh, trip cost calculator are surprised by exactly how much it costs. And they don't charge that back to the builder, just the cost of doing business. But imagine if we were able to collaboratively work with our trades to uh, find out why it's happening. And if we're able to eliminate that waste, how much savings on, the, on your trades bottom line would that would happen? I had a, a, a truck that I would, of ornamental plasters that I sent to the Ed Sullivan Theater and uh, four ornamental plasters. And it was a four week project to point up all the ornamental plaster in the Ed Sullivan Theater in New York City. So the truck went out there and these are artisans. And, uh, it's a, uh, this, and just to find out that the job is not ready for us. It's gonna be delayed a week. Now I've got a four week job that I've planned on doing. Now I have to do it in three weeks. It's, it's just huge. And, and I can't send them someplace else. These are ornamental plaster. I don't have a dozen ornamental plaster jobs going on at the same time. Not like uh, sheetrock painters. We could put them somewhere else. These folks had to go home for a week. It was horrible, so painful. What do they think that cost me? So job ready, job complete, number one waste. And, and Scott Saddam uh, says, the builder who schedules the best is the best builder, plain and simple. So anybody hear of the uh, contractor's triangle? Doug, you heard this, right? Yes, sir. Uh, you can have it high speed, uh, low cost, and high quality. So we're fast, low cost, and high quality. The old contractor's triangle. Well, you can pick only two. You want it uh, fast and low price, you're gonna lose quality. 
You want high quality and low cost, it's gonna take a little while. And if you want it uh, fast and low cost, it's gonna, you're gonna hurt, uh, you're gonna have a, a bad quality. Pick any two. Until I learned about leaning out the flow, the workflow. So workflow, lean is getting from point A to point B faster. And all we have to do is, is eliminate the waste. And we define that as something that, that doesn't add value. And, and the, who defines value? The customer defines value. So something that the customer wouldn't pay for is waste. Each task takes time and money. Your sales team says to your home buyer, look, if you sign today, we got a special deal. We're gonna give you uh, uh, three wasted trips for the price of one. And so a wasted trip is about 300 bucks a piece. And so three, so that's, a, that's, that's 60% off. What's your customer going to say? What's a wasted trip? Why do I need that? They won't. So we, 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 we remove eight tasks uh, to do it previously, going from point A to point B. We remove the waste. And guess what? It's only five tasks now. So we've, we've eliminated waste saves time and we've eliminated uh, waste, uh, uh, saves money because each task costs money and time. And we simplified by leaning out the workflow and now uh, less chance for mistakes and defects, which is a higher quality. Now you can have all three, the lean tractors guy. You can have it fast, low cost and high quality, if you gotta make sure that your systems are, are lean. So a classic uh, um, Muda, as, uh, as Japanese call it, uh, uh, memory thing is uh, uh, Tim Wood is at, will help remember the an acronym for each of the letters of Tim Wood. Tim, uh, T for transporting. Well, that was just what happened earlier in the wasted trip, moving all that equipment and materials and people. I for inventory. I had a builder who was promised a 3% savings if they uh, did bulk purchasing. And so they did. Now they had a warehouse. They had uh, uh, the 3% the, the savings that they thought they were going to get actually cost them 20% in theft, damage, and warehousing. M is for motion of uh, people. So your carpenter goes up to the roof, sees that he needs a screwdriver, goes down the ladder, Gets a screwdriver, goes up the ladder, screws the screwdriver, goes back down the ladder, gets a hammer, goes up the, and that's wasted of motion when he can be wearing a tool belt. Waiting is waiting for materials or uh, clarification on a question that, that uh, wasn't clear. Uh, overproducing is just in case, building something just in case, creates inventory. And, and you, so you don't want to do that. And overprocessing, if two columns are enough to support the the uh, front porch, why, three columns better. And then you find out that the customer doesn't like the third column because it inter interferes with their view. And defects causes rework and rework doing something twice is really a no brainer. So you've heard of the, the uh, comedian, Jeff Foxworthy, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Your baby might, you're, you might be a redneck you might be a redneck if you own a home that is mobile and five of your cars aren't. You just might be a redneck if you think the stock market is a, has a fence around it. Uh, you might be a redneck if your stereo speakers used to belong to a drive-in theater. And you just might be a redneck if you ever cut your grass and found a car. Well, your baby might be ugly if you allow last minute changes to the scope of work. What happened, Hal? Your baby might be ugly if you, uh, PO does not match the plans that you have to call for a clarification. Site super calls the purchasing, purchasing calls the designer, architect. If your trades don't self inspect the quality and you fail inspections, your baby might be ugly if you uh, uh, have a poor schedule and cause waste of trips. And, hello. and uh, your baby might be ugly if your wrong material is sent to the job site and gets installed 
that's happening, it really happening. Uh, your baby might be ugly if the previous trade didn't clean up, and now your new trade has to clean up before they can start their cycle, their task work, which wasn't in their scope of work. Your baby might be ugly if you cannot deliver the cabinets because the bricklayer scaffold is in the way. What? That's a scheduling deal too. Here, if your trades don't trust your schedule and have to send a scout to check to see if the job is really ready, they have to pay a, a salary for somebody to drive around to put eyes on that on your job site. Your baby might be ugly if your painting contractor doesn't do proper protection and gets paint splatter on the new floors. And now your cleaning teams have to clean up dried paint. Your baby might be ugly if the names of your systems and processes are willy and nilly. You don't have a ro robust, oh, I want to get, say it right, process. I got to learn the language up here in case I have to move here. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I hope that answered your question. I really appreciate uh, being allowed to present today. Uh, thank you so much, Doug. Hal, it's, uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for doing that, uh, that review for us. I really appreciate it. This uh, last slide that you had right there, that's actually from our, uh, our lean company session back in, uh, I think it was January of this year, right? Yeah. So I'm just going to start uh, to share my screen again here and uh, you should be good to go. So I wanted to, can you see, uh, it says, should say, is your baby ugly now? Yep, it does. Perfect, perfect. So uh, I wanted the opportunity to go a little bit further into this with you because you know, we've done two, two deep dive sessions with, uh, with your company. Uh, just, you never, you never quite mentioned, I don't think, you, you did talk about the Muda, but tell me a bit about Kaizen. Kaizen, it, it, you know, the lean was, uh, uh, comes from the Toyota way, the Toyota process. Uh, the Japanese car manufacturer learned from Henry Ford the, how to make things lean. And uh, Kaizen was uh, introduced in the uh, 80s as uh, uh, literally translated as Kai is change and Zen is good. So Kaizen is a good change and it's continual improvement, basically, which is one of uh, Dr. Deming's um, 14 obligations of management, continually improving. And then so if, if we're looking at doing Kaizen, we're looking at, at doing a, a deeper dive on how to make improvements to our process. That's correct. And, and eliminating the Muda. So Muda, what is Muda? Muda is simply a, so another Japanese word for waste. Waste is something that the customer wouldn't pay for, be really upset if they found out that they were paying for it. So really what we're talking about is trying to eliminate Muda or get rid of the waste, right? Exactly. Um, tell me a bit about when you guys are coming in, uh, and, and I know we do it now regularly, but uh, doing a Muda site walk. Yeah, I encourage that. You know, we hear when we do a site walk with the builders, we hear that, well, I can't believe this is happening. Uh, we need to fix this right away or, or look in the bins and see all whole sheets of plywood or lumber. And, and, and sometimes in the bins, you'll find new unopened boxes of duct and, and, and shingle. So uh, whole cubes of brick, I mean, are being thrown away. And the builder doesn't know that unless they go out and see. Gemba is go and see, sidewalk. Go and see Gemba. So uh, I know when Scott originally came up here to do the very first site walk, he was surprised that, that our waste was actually fairly low, relatively speaking. And he saw these specific bins right. and, uh, and really liked them because they were smaller. And so uh, you made the case for smaller dumpsters. Well, the, the, the fact of the matter is, so I, you know, I worked with one builder. He doesn't have dumpsters at all. No dumpsters, right? You yeah. can't get any smaller than that. He, uh, in the scopes of work, he require each trade to take away their trash. And, and if they supply it, guess what? They're gonna, the, the takeoffs are gonna be very accurate because they don't want any waste. They're gonna be in, have an incentive to do, to do that so they don't have to carry it back to the shop. Uh, but the, the, uh, I always talk about on, Ontario municipalities requiring, because it's not so in the States, that requiring recycling and, and, you know, I talk about the, the power of recycling, get the cardboard out of the, out of the, out of your bins, get the uh, clean lumber out of your bins, get even sheetrock out, out of your bins, because that could all be recycled. 
Yeah, you know, and we've got a couple of trades, uh, more than a few now that do that with us so that there, there's no waste uh, developed on our job site from uh, our drywaller uh, uh, boarding crews and also from uh, our roofing companies is, is two that come to mind. Uh, but it's definitely made a big impact for us. And, and so just in case anybody's interested, I do have the link down at the, at the bottom here. Yeah, uh, great, great company, but very helpful. And they do supply the paperwork needed for meeting your recycling requirements as well. Uh, we found it really cut down on waste going to the smaller bins, though. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, optimal value engineering. So I spent a bit of time on it uh, earlier, but I, I just wanted to double back with you on this because obviously eliminating waste is exactly a, a, a optimal value engineering is a version of this. I talked about the room at 12.6 versus the carpet and just wanted to get your take on, on some optimal value engineering points that you've seen over the years. Yeah, well, when you, when you moved your, your uh, rooms down to 12 foot or a little bit that your carpet is coming in 12 feet increments uh, on the roll. And so you don't have seams and you don't have wasted material. You, you're gonna have to cut that for 12 six, but also you, your floors, your, your, your uh, subfloors are, are less, uh, less waste in the plywood, the subfloor in the, in sheetrock, less waste in sheetrock because the rooms are sized accordingly. So it's, it's a very good practice. So how many, uh, how many builders have you worked for? Can you think of up in Canada where you've gone into doing this type of deeper dive on optimal value engineering or, or reducing Muda? Oh, how many? Yeah. Oh man. A lot. Yeah. Um, and no. varying <laughs> sizes, I guess too, eh? Oh yeah. No, from the largest home builder in Toronto, with came out with uh, I think 220 230 ideas to you uh, I can't remember I think we had 120 150 ideas yeah it was 150 uh, I think yeah yeah and and so uh, it, it, the 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 trades really do bring it in when you've encouraged them and that's a side benefit of the lean blitz is the the, the power that we're empowering our trades to help us eliminate pain for them, from them. And I tell them, it doesn't matter which side of the fence the savings falls on. It saves you money, that's great. It saves builder money, that's great too. But at the end of the day, we want to identify the waste and, and so the customer will have true, true value. That's the goal. Uh, we, you touched on it briefly. I wanted to come back and just go through, uh, just as a conversation here, removing of, of over detailing. Yeah, over processing. Right? <laughs> yeah, and, and I know I, I like to reflect back on when Scott was here because he's uh, Scott Saddam, the, the the president of True North. He's got a real thing about about having the shutters be if they're on the house, oh. they should match the window size, right? And he was giving me the gears because ours, you know, didn't, and probably he, a few of them still don't, right? <laughs> yeah, no, he hates it, and he sees those shutters even if they are the correct size. He does not like it because yeah, they're not yeah. functioning. But if they, especially if they don't cover the window when they're closed. Oh my goodness, I, I, he just carves, goes on and on about that. Why? That's an important question. You understand why do you do something? Does it add value? Will the customer say, yeah, I want fake shutters on my, my, uh, on my, on my house. It doesn't do anything. So when we have to deal with things like um, architectural detailing requirements though and, and non-repeating of, of elevations, Oh yeah, now, some some of the um, uh, HOAs in in the states as a home home uh, what's it called the home HOA uh, it's improvement home, association. association homeowners association oh yeah home, homeowner association yeah uh, so the um, there were some are so strict that they'll have uh, the downspouts have to match the color of the, the background. So you'll have some houses are have one color siding up to the bottom of the, the windows and then another color down to the ground. So we have to find downspouts to mat, not only change colors, but match the color of the siding uh, from uh, above the, the window. Then, and, and the spout has to change colors going from the window down to the ground. It's, it's just incredibly not lean. So any advice to, to builders about what to look for for when they're trying to do that third elevation in order to make things work and not get crazy besides be careful of, our, of architects? Yeah, no, uh, the, um, 
in the art. That's the other problem is that the drawings are very dear to the architects. Uh, and, and so people are, uh, trades are afraid to comment on it. Um, but I recommend that you keep it simple. You know, simplifying, lean is simplifying. And I would pick the top elevations that you, there's some elevations that you never sell and, and, and simplify your, your, your plans and elevations as much as possible. Keep, be mindful of it. We're actually doing a Kaizen in about a week, uh, just over a week between our decor team and our design team. And what we're looking at is notes on plans. Right. What, oh, yeah. What's causing, what's causing you guys pain? You know, what, what, what do we need to have that we don't have enough detail and where have we got over detailing that we can maybe remove? Yeah. True North so, does a, a plan, a lean plan workout too. And uh, we, we, we ask our trades to actually comment on a set of plans, top three sell, best sellers and write their comments on, on the plans and come in just like we did with the Lean Blitz, where we asked them for their ideas. And the, here's our, our plan specific ideas. And a I lot of them how, if, a if, lot of them are missing details that they need. Yeah, yeah. So I meant to, I meant to mention this earlier on, but it's, it's a good point about the missing details. Um, do, do you know what the number one thing that happens on a job site is? Uh, no. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing happens on the job site most of the time. And so, you know, it's bad enough that you're not working through the night because, you know, people do need some time off and most of them don't work on Sundays and, and things like that. They got a little bit of weekend time. So there's a lot of times that the house is shut down, but when they're sitting there and they're supposed to be producing and they've got to wait for an answer, right? that's why we're having this update with our, with our decor and, and design team because we've got guys like the, the uh, siding guy going, I don't know what the answer is here. I, I, I got to make a phone call. And it's right. that call that you mentioned where oh, he's not phone, able to proceed. Wait, phone call is terrible. You know, you yeah. think of a 10 minute phone call is not 10 minute. It's not a 10 minute phone call because if it's 10 minutes on the trades time, it's 10 minutes on the builder's time. And the builder has to find out the answer to that question. We once mapped it out, a phone call for clarification. It's huge amount of waste in a simple yeah. phone call. Yeah, yeah. No, we're, we're finding that. And that's why we're having this follow-up meeting. Uh, okay, so this one has become near and dear to my heart for, for sure. Uh, so we, we have uh, a requirement of our trades to do job ready, job complete, and, and broom clean. And so maybe just go to the origins of this and what the benefit is. Well, job ready, job complete is is, a, is really like a no-brainer because it causes wasted trips and dry runs for the next trade and and broom clean i mean i where I, I shadowed a site super once and and as we walked into the uh, site the, the building they the the night before people were putting the hat channel up on the uh on the ceiling so that the the sheet rockers can fur it fur it out furring strip use the hat channels furring strip and left tin snips of the U channel all over the floor. So the next morning, the drywallers had to roll their sheetrock. They had a big, the, the big uh, sheetrock hand trucks and it rolled the heavy sheetrock into, to, uh, and couldn't because of the, the metal was getting stuck in the wheels. They had to clean up the, the, the metal before they can roll the, and uh, uh, so the, 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 the the drywaller complained to the site super. Site super says to me, Al, same company did the hat channel last night. They don't, <laughs> left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. <laughs> That's probably unfortunately a little too common. You know, with getting the trades on to broom clean though, I, I know that we had to do a lot of work on this, but getting them to understand like that's a little bit more time for you, but it actually is going to save you time. Right. Yeah, actually, there was a builder that created a pre and post ch checklist. And how would you want to find the job site when you come on? You know, you don't want to spend the time cleaning up. You don't want damage to your work. You want so what what a checklist simple uh, 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 was the site clean? Was there any damage to the windows? Was there any damage to the tub? And and so that they were able to uh, say, you know, hey, yeah, that's how I want it. When I come onto a job site, I'm going to leave it for the next guy to be like that too. Yeah. 
it's kind of like I said in the last session about, or a couple of sessions ago about, you know, you don't want to be the one responsible for changing the baby's diaper, right? <laughs> that, that is an ugly baby at that yeah. point. I don't care yeah. which kid it is, <laughs> right? Communication feedback loop. So one of the things that we did uh, many years ago was we imp implemented what was called the Builder Supplier Trade Alliance. And I think we're into our sixth year now. Yeah. yeah. Um, they're very cool with the feedback loop. Yeah, no, I encourage that. In fact, that's when I left. I said, it's very important. We're making 150 changes and, and we don't want to fix something uh, upstream and be killing somebody downstream and not having a way of knowing it. So build in uh, your feedback uh, loop into all your, all your changes so that you can have the ability to hear how people are taking, how people are being impacted by the change. And also you want to create a feedback culture where it's not out of the ordinary to get feedback, positive or negative feedback. It's important to understand how, uh, how you're doing and what you need to change to make it better. So let's quantify this for half a second here. And okay. this is the, the Doug oversharing piece where my staff's probably thinking, why are you saying this? So I'm gonna do it anyway, okay? <laughs> when we did that first lean blitz, uh, we were building 50 homes a year at that time. Uh, and, and really without doing lean, it would have been very difficult for us to have been able to move up in our numbers. But that, that first lean blitz, we identified between ourselves and our trades about eight hundred thousand dollars worth of, and that's Canadian dollars, of course, right. so not quite as much yeah. as an American. Eight hundred thousand dollars worth of, of of where's the pain? Right. Yeah, and it's very painful. Uh, you know, uh, the 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 builder that did uh, eight hundred homes in the states uh, identified eight million dollars. Yeah, and that's very painful. Yeah. So when we extrapolate that out, I know my my one contractor, my plumber. He went, I think, two and a half, three years before he had to do a price increase for us because he just said, you, you're easier to build with and I'm faster on your site and my labor's less, right? Right, right. Yeah, no, that's, that's and, and so that's why it doesn't matter which side of the fence the savings falls on. If it saves the trade money, we, that's, you know, they don't charge you for those, for those callbacks, those, uh, the wasted trips. They don't charge you for that. And if we can help that with their bottom line, they're going to be in a better mindset when it comes time to new, renegotiate. Like you said, that's, uh, and that's what we really have, have found is it was very helpful that way. And that's why also we're, we're using that where's the pain form as a way to, to not just communicate with trades. We're actually using it internally with, with we, if we've identified a process and this came out of the lean company that we weren't able to finish because of COVID. If we identify a broken process, then, then we pull out the where's the pain form and have stuff. And it's not just about, oh, I'm going to have, you know, a, a cry session here. Right. Um, it's about what's the solution, right? right, right Give us yeah. an example of an answer here. Uh, well, because you know, only five days for the original lean blitz, we can't go to solution. Yeah. Uh, because there's not enough time. We're interviewing a, a, a each trade for an hour, and we're just identifying the waste. That's how. That's how. But if you can find a solution, we um, let's see an example of uh, a solution that we found. Um, for, oh, wasted trip. We need to collect the data on a wasted trip is to find out why it's happening. And, and, uh, and then when you find out the root cause of why it's happening, then you're able to uh, uh, attack it at the root cause. But you don't want to fix something, put it by slapping a Band-Aid on it, which is very common. Uh, you know, build a workaround. What happens when you build a workaround? It gets baked into the process. And now we have a, a, a more a non-lean process that could have been fixed if we've identified the root cause. So that's what we're identifying. When we ask the trades to come in with the where's the pain and their ideas on solutions, uh, that's, that's, that's the benefit. I wanna just have the, the quick version, but the, the baked in, uh, tell us about the roast beef story. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> the famous roast beef, my great grandmother, uh, made a, an unbe my, unbelievable roast beef, you know, and, and uh, so I got the recipe. And as I like to eat roast beef, and you're your chef, you know. And, uh, uh, and it was great. It melts in your mouth. It was so delicious. And the recipe called for, uh, first you cut the ends off the roast beef, and then you season salt and pepper, push the garlic, clove it, and, and, and then you put it in the, you know. I said, well, why, why do we uh, cut the ends of the roast beef? Hey, 
I asked my uh, aunt, Aunt Winnie, I said, how, why, does, why did we cut the ends of the roast beef? Hey, I, that's how we do it. You don't question, you like it? That's why. That's why we do it that way. It's the recipe. And so when I asked my great aunt, Sylvia, I said, why did gra great grandma uh, Marcy cut the uh, ends of the roast beef? And she said, look, we, we, I helped her make that roast beef. If we didn't cut the ends of the roast beef off, it wouldn't fit in the tiny oven that she had. And that's why we cut the ends off. <laughs> so always find out the reason why. No, don't do it together because that's the way we've always done it. That's not a good enough answer. And that why? gets to what is it, the five levels of why, right? Yeah, the five whys. Drill down to the root cause. The you know, Toyota will stop the assembly line if some uh, uh, something happens that's not out of the ordinary. And so they'll stop the assembly line and ask, why, why did that happen? Well, what allowed that to happen? Why did that happen? Well, yeah, but why did that happen? And so there's five whys. And then they, they can attack the root cause of why it happened, as opposed to slapping a Band-Aid, building a workaround, and keep the, the assembly line moving. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh... We did the Lean Company back in uh, December 2019. I, I think we basically have already covered this off in our, in our chat here. So uh, I guess that really leaves it to, how ugly was our baby? <laughs> yeah, every, every builder that I work with, they wouldn't call us up if they didn't have pain somewhere, but every builder is baby's very ugly. But you yeah. are doing a great job, Doug. Your team, was incredible in following up with because that's the easy part identifying the waste the hard part is making the changes that will allow the cash to start flowing in and uh uh i did a a, a lean with a company in in, in nashville uh and we d had done it five years previous and i asked the the uh the cfo was in the meeting and i went so let me ask you you did this five years ago how much money did you save? He said, well, it took about six months before I started seeing an improvement on the bottom line, about $600,000. And we identified two, $3 million of that builder five years previous. And we again identified another two or $3 million uh, on the second lien. Yeah. The Toyota, the Toyota uh, is so, the, the lean uh, Toyota um, production system is so neurotic about identifying waste that even after an I, a thing has been doing uh, well, working well, and one of the, I, I read in, lean, in uh, the Toyota way of lean, lean management, and they put the uh, potential uh, di uh, director of a, of a plant in Alabama, and they draw a circle on the plant floor. And that person has to stand there until he can identify three areas of, 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 of waste in a process that's been leaned up for how many years? So, Steph, that book's called The Toyota Way, just in case anybody's uh, curious about it. Yeah. I will include a link. I'm sure I can find it online. Okay. So, I, I know we're, uh, we're doing still pretty decent for, for time here, but we've never finished on time yet. So, who knows? Maybe today's the day. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about engaging the sales team because I did touch on sales briefly today. Right. And, and talk about the importance of of improv and, and the sales team uh, improv role playing. I know you're going to correct me on what I just said, but that's no, okay. No, no. It, it, improvisation uh, includes role play, but it's, it's much more, much more. It's, and it's, and since uh, I've worked with sales teams before and we have to encourage to them to work as a team because they're not, not most sales teams are not incentivized. They're, they're, they're paid by commission. So, but if we show them, when the tide comes in, all boats float. We want to be able to sell homes. I don't care who sells a home. Uh, so the top three rules of improvisation, a lot of rules and structure for improvisation, but the top three rules are this real quick. Always make positive choices. So, and people are attracted to positive people. And when people tell me that that'll never change, it's like a gut punch uh, because I, I've, I've been practicing improvisation for over 40 years. People are attracted to positive people. People want to work with you, uh, 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 um, collaborative with you, collaborate with you, 
enthusiastically because you're positive and you avoid negative people like the plague. The second rule is to we're constantly problem solving. So uh, in improvisation, we're constantly problem solving and be, uh, to be in the moment. And how do you know that you're in the moment? Because you can't physically be in the past and you can't physically be in the future. You can only physically be in this moment right here, right now. And what resources do I have to solve the problem right here, right now? And we all improvise, uh, internalize our knowledge. Uh, if you, you know, you, I'm sure this happened to many people. You're driving uh, your car, drinking a cup of coffee, talking on your Bluetooth, and 20 minutes later, you're at your destination. Well, what you don't know how you got there. What happened during those last 20 minutes? You're on autopilot. You 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 were you were in the zone. You were in the moment. Or you great blew bet. past the exit. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, right. Or a great basketball player knows where all his teammates are. So when he goes up for that layup, the last second will pass it to somebody and, and successfully magically pass it to somebody because he did it in the moment and not in uh, uh, thinking about it because then it'll be too late outside the moment. So, And uh, uh, the number one rule in improvisation, very simply, is to make the other person look great. All rules can be broken in improvisation except for that one rule. And we've got uh, four people on stage all trying to make the other person look great. So it's not about me, it's about you. What do you need to look great? And uh, that creates a safety net that you know that you can take a huge risk setting each other up for success. And regardless of how the outcome is, you cannot fail because no matter what you do, the other teammates will justify whatever you do. And that's a great feeling knowing that you cannot fail. Yeah, and uh, you know, people tend to have their silos. Right. So having the opportunity to break down silos by, by knowing the others involved are in a safe zone is kind of really critically important. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. You mentioned one thing in that in there that that is kind of a critical thinking piece, and that's well, that's the way we've always done it. Right. And, uh, and, and breaking down that specific silo, that is really, to me, one of the biggest ugly baby pieces is, well, we've always done it that way. Well, no, actually we used to build a, a 28 foot wide house by you know 40 feet long and it was a 412 pitch with gables on the end. And we did this stupid thing like a cantilever of a kitchen. Right, right. right. <laughs> uh, you know, some of those things we don't do anymore. So please don't tell me that's the way we've always done it because we don't build 412 pitches anymore. Right, Usually, right, yeah. No, it's and and you'll go save money and material if you you change the pitch of your roof. Uh, it's safer for the folks to work on the roof. Yeah. Um, it's just so many other outside benefits. But one of the things that I really enjoy is that is that we're removing the fear. We're yeah. encouraging and empowering our trades to come in and help with the pro, uh, uh, improved process. Uh, Something I've learned since the five years, Hal, is I've, I've found out that framers don't typically like a roof pitch above a, a 9, 912 pitch. Right, right. It, it's, it's a lot more work and it's actually a little scary for them and they hate 12, 12 and above. Right, yes. So that, that huge roof, like unless you're putting an, an attic uh, room up in there, does it really need to be that big, right? Ex exactly, right. Uh, lean is green, eh? Absolutely. We're talking about net zero homes, but lean is green. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because you imagine, you know, when you've got a, a big uh, tractor trailer truck uh, going out to uh, do a hot shot, uh, 12 sticks, a uh, uh, two by four uh, in that big empty, you know, empty vehicle driving that fuel uh, waste, um, uh, the, uh, the exhaust from that trip. Wasted trips are, are, we eliminate wasted trips. Uh, we'll cut down on the, on the, on the, you know, the carbon footprint that we're killing ourselves with. It'd be interesting to do a carbon calculator on the wasted trips and see how much we actually save by cutting those down. Right. Besides would, would... the, besides the manpower and the insurance and the cash value, how yeah, much absolutely. are we saving for the environment? Absolutely, absolutely. I think we're up on a question stuff. And I, I don't yes. know if I, if I screwed up or, or what, but I apologize no, no, if I did. No, you're all good. Let's just see. I was, uh, now I had the uh, Tim Wood question. Um, did we want to do that one or do we? Yeah, sure. Because it's, so I, I messed up on this. I apologize. That, that's, no that's problem. Totally wrong. 
Yeah, so we've got a couple of poll questions. So I'll do the Tim Wood first. So you remember uh, Hal had talked about Tim Wood, the acronym. So what we want to know is where does your company need help the most in that acronym? So there was the the wasted trips, the the inventory, the the I love the the description you gave Hal of the guy walking up and down the ladder <laughs> 47 times, uh, waiting time, overproducing, overprocessing, and then uh, defects and rework. <laughs> you know, the Jerry Lewis movie where the, he's in charge of the candy store and the kid comes in, says, yeah, I want a nickel's worth of, of uh, the, the red jelly beans. And he gets up and gets the ladder over there, goes up to the top, gets the jar, comes back down the ladder, opens it up, gives the three cents worth of brings the jar back up to the ladder, up the, to the top shelf, and then comes back down again and says to the next kid, and what would you like? I said, oh, I'd like a nickel worth of red jelly beans. He gets the ladder, goes back up again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's see. It looks like about uh, people are still voting. So while you guys were talking, I was quite inspired by your 10 minute phone call uh, conversation because I've actually done a 10 minute calculation on my own life looking for my keys, for example, wasting 10 <laughs> minutes a day. So I did a calculation. I was like, if one employee were to waste 10 minutes on a phone call every single day for the full 52 weeks of a, of a year, how many hours do you think that works out to? 43 hours. 43 hours. An entire work week of hours for one employee for 10 minutes of day for the 260 working days. Yeah. We're well, actually looking at that expensive. stuff for, uh, for where to put our new office building. Ah. Yeah, no. Okay, so... I'm going to share these uh, polling results. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing because I was, you know, thinking even uh, just looking for my keys, you know, for 10 minutes a day, it works out to like uh, 60 hours in a year or something like that when you consider the weekends. But so waiting time looks like it's, uh, it's, the, it's the big one here. Yeah, uh, one. All, yeah. Uh, so we've got one other, which is the poll question, the lean processes uh, coming up. So do you plan on implementing lean processes in the coming year? All right, it looks like about half of the people have responded. So I'm gonna go ahead and share these results. So it looks like the majority have said yes with um, a couple saying no, but I, I'm interested there's some that are not applicable. Is there lean practices that could be in any job, Hal? Or oh yes, absolutely. We work with uh, trade contractors and, and, and when, the, when the trades finish a, a lean week, they wanna go back onto their side and lean up their company. So we've got, mm. we, we've done work with uh, usually building suppliers. Mm. Experts, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it looks like we have some that are, um, that are experts in this area already. So that is excellent to hear, so. Very cool, we're, so we're coming up on the clock. So Hal, mm -hmm. if you don't mind, just in case we get through it and have a couple of questions at the end for you. Uh, but I think I've just got a couple slides to go here and we should be done. So just sure. bear with me guys. Why build a hundred year home? If we follow the current building code, you're gonna have a home that's probably durable for hopefully about 50 years, right? Uh, by that point, we're all gonna be long gone, really. You know, I mean, I know we're, we're gonna last longer and age longer and that sort of thing, but we'll be gone, right? So why build for a hundred years? Number one, because we can. Number two, because our planet's gonna demand it. And there's an old Beatles song, fixing the hole where the rain gets in. And uh, this is a house that I had to have the back end of it torn off because we had mold in this cantilevered floor area. And they had to replace uh, a few of the joists. They had to double some up. They had to put a new rim on. The entire wall over here had to get ripped out and redone because it was so infiltrated with mold, right? Why? Bad flashing, bad detail over, the, uh, over top of the wall so there wasn't enough insulation and somebody had framed a deck right under the cantilever, which like, wow, kill me, please. Really? <laughs> so, you know, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a gut job at that point, right? And yeah. I, I've got a bunch of them in front of me that we're gonna have to do this with. So why? Well, to save pain down the road, because if that stuff's going to the land mill, uh, land, land uh, fill, it, it ain't being lean and it's not being green, right? 
And then the last one is what's next for DTL? Well, um, I think I've already talked about it, to be honest with you, besides, you know, we're going to continue on our path of net zero and we're thrilled to have Jennifer joining us. Uh, a deeper dive on comfort. We're on that path already. And we're going to continue down that path. Indoor air quality is something that we've got to address. And as a company, we're already well underway on dealing with indoor air quality as well. Carbon reduction. I thought that was a fantastic uh, session to kick us off with in here. Uh, I had already learned a bit. I learned a lot more during uh, Chris's presentation and we're really thrilled to be uh, getting ready to do the alpha test on the calculator. Climate resiliency, well, we're, we're doing some things on climate resiliency and we're, we're gonna continue our work with Western and, and improve our product so it's more durable, right? Uh, also about community housing and housing affordability. I think that that's really critical and that's why we're looking at tiny homes as an option. We've been a proponent of the not so big house for a very long time. I don't see that changing anytime soon. I think the actually the market's coming back towards, towards us now, to be honest with you. And, uh, and, and Tiny Hope is a tiny homes project that we're hoping to do with the YWCA in the next year. And we are thrilled about this because it's for at-risk families in low-income housing and, and people out in the street right now. So stay tuned on that one, folks. But, uh, you know, gosh, all I can say is thanks to our sponsors. Uh, they've been great to, to help us get through these sessions. And a big, big thank you for everybody that tuned in. It's been a lot of fun. It was a lot of work, but it's been a lot of fun. And uh, Steph, I'm one minute over. <laughs> Uh, you know what? Not too bad, actually, considering the first one, I think, uh, what were we, 15 minutes over? So you've gotten better. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, Doug, and thank you, Enbridge, for sponsoring this. Thank you. I know, Doug, it was a lot of work to uh, to put four sessions together. Really appreciate Hal uh, for joining us on this session. And uh, so just keep in mind, I'll send an email with all of the resources that we had talked about today. And uh, we do have some upcoming sessions. Uh, so Susan mentioned the January session with um, uh, with AVID ratings and the uh, new buyer, uh, home buyer preference survey for 2020. We also have in December, a, a December 3rd, uh, cracking the building code. It has to do with uh, performance and A1 and ways in which you can save money on construction. December 10th, which is a session sponsored by Enbridge. It's a national tiered energy code. So be sure to register for that. And um, Doug, it's been a lot of fun. And thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And I uh, hope you found value in that. And please, once we close the session out, uh, answer the survey. And uh, we appreciate your feedback. Thanks, Steph. Thanks again, Hal. Really appreciate yeah, you joining thank me you today. Thank you for the invite. I appreciate it, yeah. Doug. And it was fun. Very cool. Thanks, Good Stephanie. Appreciate your help. Absolutely. Thank you. And it couldn't be done without Enbridge and Enbridge's sponsorship. So, of course, we appreciate that. There were some question and answers uh, from the prior sessions. And so I'm amalgamating all four into one document, and then I'll send that out to everybody. So Fantastic. Okay. Thanks. So thank you so much. I hope you have a great evening. Talk to you later, everybody. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.